I published a written review of the Evercade hardware, which I will link to in the description below, but I think it's safe to say that I have been thoroughly enjoying the console ever since it graced the door of my horribly air-conditioned house. Enjoying enough to finally make good on the video content I promised 10 years ago, and enough to shut my AC off in the 90 degree weather for the purpose of recording this audio. One thing I will note for those of you who don't read the hardware review is that the Evercade is a cart-based handheld console with licensed cartridges. I did have the Namco cartridge get stuck in the system, which is a problem with the launch cartridges from time to time. Luckily, I managed to get the cart out without doing much damage to the system, or any damage, I should say, but it did require a knife and some precision. The Evercade launched with 10 cartridges, and I intend to review all of them. The first card up on the docket is Atari Collection Number 1. Thankfully, you don't have to put too much consideration into this one, because it is included in every console pack. The card is loaded with 20 games, spanning the Atari 2600 through the 7800. I will talk about each game in the order that it is released, which is sort of alphabetically-ish. Number 1. Alien Brigade Game number one on the Atari collection is Alien Brigade, originally released in 1990 for the Atari 7800. Alien Brigade is an on-rails light gun shooter and one that historically has not been included in Atari collections, possibly because it was meant to be played with a light gun. It is actually one of the more expensive carts on the market and can run you from $60 up to over $100 depending on the quality of the cartridge. I guess the Evercade really does pay for itself. Alien Brigade is mostly acceptable. Without a useful manual, there are a lot of things to learn by trial and error, especially in the realm of what to shoot at and what not to shoot at, and that gets more confusing when you realize that the game hasn't quite figured this out itself. People run around all over the screen, pop up out of nowhere, and take shots at you. You can shoot projectiles out of the air and items left on the ground to replenish ammo and health. If you know what you're doing, Alien Brigade can be completed in under 20 minutes. If not, the game gets a lot more frustrating as you try to figure out why you are hitting instant game over screens. For example, the Evercade manual won't tell you that you can bring your reticle up to the top left corner to activate the radio. And you need to activate the radio for important context surrounding your mission, such as the singular helicopter you are not supposed to blow up in level 1 that will cause an immediate game over. I also couldn't find an answer to this online, but I'm pretty sure there is a bug in the game. Once you hit level 2, there are enemies called Rambo Aliens who shoot at you and throw grenades. The actual manual states that these guys are worth a thousand points, but I lose a thousand points for shooting them. I even found a few gameplay videos online, and in every one of them, the player loses a thousand points for killing these Rambo Aliens. Whatever. It doesn't matter in the long run. Thumbs up. Adventure. No. Thumbs down. Aquaventure. This one is interesting. Aquaventure is a game that was developed by Atari for the 2600 to the point of near completion and then mysteriously cancelled and never saw launch. The prototype was pirated and has since appeared via Atari flashback consoles. Aquaventure puts you in the role of a scuba diver gathering treasures for a mermaid, a plot that isn't too wild for 80s era gaming. You accomplish this goal by diving deep and avoiding all of the fish that want you dead and can kill you on contact. I can appreciate the attention to detail from the colors of the fish to how the game represents your remaining oxygen, with a turtle slowly walking across the screen toward a sign that says air. If we could only have that in real life. You do get points for killing fish, but the game doesn't want you to do that and will punish you by replacing those fish with smaller, faster moving fish. The point is to only kill when absolutely necessary. It's like going grocery shopping. Honestly, I like the faster fish. They may be harder to dodge, but they only move in one direction and are actually easier to navigate since they aren't pinpointing after you. It's obvious that the game is unfinished owing to how the fish can still kill you despite being dead and how the color palette could use some work. I don't know if this looked better on an 80s television, but with the constant blue on blue, I had a hard time following my character much of the game. 
it's even worse on handheld mode or I'm colorblind and wasn't aware of it. Difficulty in AquaVenture comes down to having to travel further into more confined spaces and with less time. Given this is a prototype game, I'm willing to go a little easier on it and say that it is a valuable addition to the pack for historical purposes. Thumbs up. Asteroids. Asteroids is an Atari ass Atari game, and it has everything you could ask for to represent an Atari 2600 title. Tune up soundtrack that sounds like Jaws? Check. Single note firing? Check. Ear splitting one up sound? That's the good stuff. It is arcade gaming distilled to its purest form, shooting, getting points, and not dying. Atari 2600 Asteroids contains 66 game variations, and if that sounds impressive, you're probably not familiar with Atari games. Effectively, each variation is a minor alteration of the game's design rules, deciding things like how many points you need to get an extra life, speed of asteroids, and whether your ship has extra functions like shields. It's hard to say anything bad about asteroids, so I'm just going to nitpick and say this. It's very easy to accidentally hit the start button thinking you are going to pause the game, only to remember that for 2600 titles, this is the reset button. Thumbs up. Canyon Bomber. Canyon Bomber is bad. Designed in 1978 for the 2600, Canyon Bomber is an early example of terrible Atari games. The premise of Canyon Bomber is stupidly simple. You bomb canyons. You compete against the computer player to rack up points, and the game basically comes down to whoever starts frantically bombing the canyon will win by a long shot, and generally end up so far ahead that there's no chance of catching up. It's like reverse Quidditch, except if you shoot too soon, your bomb just disintegrates into thin air. Otherwise, Canyon Bomber has no strategy to note. You just bomb into the canyon until someone wins. There's no control over your plane, the bombs, or really anything else. The only interesting part of Canyon Bomber is Sea Bomber, mode 7 and 8, or it would be interesting if the game wasn't completely broken. Sometimes bombs explode on contact, sometimes they just pass right through, and sometimes they blow up when they shouldn't. Thumbs down. Crystal Castles. Crystal Castles is what happens when you give Pac-Man too much sugared cereal. It's an isometric collection game where you roam around the map picking up dots and avoiding the monsters that are trying to kill you. Effectively, it is multi-level Pac-Man with the ability to jump. Crystal Castles isn't a terrible Atari game, but it isn't great, and I found my hand cramping quickly while holding the Evercade, which didn't happen with the other games. I have to assume that this game plays better holding the joystick than using the D-pad. As far as visuals and audio goes, Crystal Castles is pretty impressive for an Atari game. Impressive to the extent that the developers tried an isometric angle on a console that clearly can't support it. It can become difficult to tell where exactly characters are on the map and how to jump to avoid hitting the wall or landing on a monster. I'm sure there's someone out there who's a big fan of Crystal Castles, but I don't see this being a big plus to many others. Thumbs down. Centipede. Another Atari-ass Atari game. Centipede is one of those games that is legally mandated to show up in every Atari collection, and if you don't believe me, you can check the law books yourself. If you call yourself a gamer, you should probably play a round or two at least once in your lifetime. Centipede is the distillation of the sensory overload that had a tendency to accompany arcade titles of the time. The games that gobbled up the quarters of small children like they were munchkins from Dunkin' Donuts and kept you coming back to get your initials on the high scores every week. For the hardcore, Centipede just isn't the same without a trackball controller. If you grew up playing this game on any of the home console ports, you probably don't have that same level of commitment, and a controller will do just fine. There is no doubting the extra accuracy that the trackball provides. If you're going to go ham on the Atari collection, odds are that you are already familiar with Centipede. It's a must-have for any Atari nostalgia fan. Thumbs up. Double dunk. I have no clue what's going on in this game. Thumbs down. Desert Falcon. 
Released on the 2600 in 1987, Desert Falcon is listed as a maze game. It is not a maze game. Instead, you move your falcon down a singular path in the bland desert, picking up high rows and avoiding things and dying for seemingly no reason. Desert Falcon is one of those games that tries to do something far more complicated than the 2600 was capable of, and radically fails at it. What you get is an isometric game on a console not meant to support an isometric game, much like Crystal Castles. I have no idea what is trying to kill me, and for most of the time, I don't know how to avoid it. It's boring, repetitive, dull, confusing, and frustrating. Thumbs down. Food Fight. Now this is my jam. Food Fight is a 1987 Atari 7800 title that serves as propagandist advertising for Ben and Jerry's. Okay, not really. Food Fight puts you in the role of a very large-headed child on the prowl for some tasty, tasty ice cream. You are Charlie Chuck at the carnival, partaking in the Food Fight contest. Standing in the way of your sweet treats are potholes, piles of food, and chefs who are taking part in the food fight, or are adversaries, or for some other reason want to stop you from getting the ice cream. It was 1987. The plot makes a little bit more sense if you're a game designer whose diet consists mostly of cocaine. Food Fight is definitely most memorable for the scene at the end of each level where Charlie unhinges his jaw to eat the entire ice cream cone in one bite. This is a quintessential Atari game and a definite positive for the cartridge. Thumbs up. Gravatar. Gravatar is impressive from a development standpoint, but as a game it is absolute crap. Odds are your first death in Gravatar is going to be 3 seconds after the game starts when you are immediately pulled into the sun. The goal here is to travel around the planets and blow up the turrets located on the surface so you can escape and watch the planet explode. Look, story wasn't much of a thing back then. Where Gravatar impresses yet fails is in the gravity system. You get used to the gravity after a while, and for a hot minute, Gravatar actually becomes enjoyable. And then you get to the stages with extreme gravity and winding corridors and just kind of think, yeah, forget this, it's not worth the time. Gravatar was a massive failure when it came out in the 1980s, and it is still a flop today. Thumbs down. Missile Command. Another one of those classic Atari games, Missile Command needs no introduction. Now let me introduce it. You control a missile base on an alien planet that is under attack from another alien planet for reasons. All you need to know is that they are bad, you are good, and they want to destroy your planet with missiles. You need to shoot down their missiles with your anti-missiles. Missile Command is cunningly difficult in how it requires you to plan and shoot ahead. Outside of dealing with a limited supply of ammo, the game continues to throw new wrenches in the bucket every few levels. As with Asteroids and Centipedes, it's a must-have for any Atari collection. Thumbs up. Motor Psycho. Released in 1990 for the Atari 7800, Motor Psycho is definitely my favorite game so far, and not just because of the awesome name. It's very reminiscent of the arcade racers of the time, the time trial games where the goal isn't to get in first place, but just to get past the finish line with time remaining. Your motorcycle has two gears, and learning when and how to intelligently shift between the two is paramount to not slamming into other motorcycles or hitting turn signs and exploding. Motorcycle exploding into flames thankfully isn't an instant game over. It does lose you precious seconds, and you need all the time you can get in order to actually finish a race. I haven't finished many races. Still, the game is fun to master and surprisingly easy on the eyes once you get used to the interesting perspective tricks to make it seem like a 3D game. Thumbs up. Night Driver. Nope. Trash. No. Trash. Senseless. Throw it out. Thumbs down. Ninja Golf. Ninja Golf is the product of a company that wanted to make a golf game, but all they had on hand were art assets from an unfinished ninja title. At least, that's my theory. For what it's worth, Ninja Golf is a cool concept. You putt your ball and then run after it, fighting ninjas and gophers along the way. 
I don't know why there are dozens of ninjas per hole, but I don't claim to be a member of any ninja golf courses. Theoretically, this should just be a more engaging golf game since you're doing more than getting your timing right on the putter. In practice, you get a jack-of-all-trades, master-of-none situation where ninja golf feels like an incomplete golf game mixed with an incomplete fighting game. Both sides are perfectly serviceable, but neither feels like they've had the amount of development time needed to get them all the way to the finish line. It also suffers from the old issue of instantly respawning enemies, impeding progress, and making the game so darn tedious. Also, kudos to the developer for adding in different environments to fight through, each with their own animals to beat up. Despite my problems with it, Ninja Golf is one of those must-play games on the 7800 if only for the experience of saying you've done it. The game is mostly acceptable and is good competition to see who can get the high score. Thumbs up. Steeplechase. Steeplechase is an example of creativity in the early Atari era. It is a horse racing game that essentially boils down to how well you can time your jumps. Time them well and the horse will maintain momentum. Knock over the hurdles and you lose knock over the hurdles and your horse loses speed. Win the race and you win the race. It's one of those easy to pick up, hard to master games, and the higher difficulties in steeplechase are hard as hell. You basically need to play the game perfectly in order to maybe pull off a win at those levels, and I say maybe because it still isn't a guarantee. Much like the other arcade games, Steeplechase turns three minutes of gameplay into something you could spend months mastering. Steeplechase does lose a lot of its attracting pull on the Evercade without multiplayer, but this version is still worth playing for those who haven't experienced it, which I'm willing to bet is most of you watching this. Thumbs up. Sword Quest Earthworld. I own physical copies of Earthworld and Fireworld for the Sword Quest series. I would also own Waterworld, but the cartridge costs between several hundred and several thousand dollars, and there's no way I'm paying that amount for an Atari 2600 game. There is no reason to genuinely play Earthworld in 2020, and especially not via the Evercade. It's a game that was designed to be as close to incompletable as possible because it was tied to a contest where completing the game got you closer to winning oodles of money. In order to play Earthworld the way it was designed, you need three things, two of which you most definitely do not have. The accompanying comic book, the manual, and an extensive knowledge of Zodiac signs. The goal of the game is to move items around between rooms, complete mini-games meant for 99.999% of the public to never finish, and solve the puzzle. The things you find in the world are clues that reference words in the comic book, and you need the manual to reference those clues. Put the items in the right room, collect the right objects, and find the words to complete the game. Submit those words to Atari, and they were giving away hundreds of thousands of dollars, about 150 grand total, in jewelry. But the whole game is a vessel for the contest, and that contest has been over for nearly 40 years. The Sword Quest series are games that existed for a specific time and place that is now gone. The existence and extravagance of the competition ironically was part of the culture that led to Atari's bankruptcy that caused the series and the competition to never be finished. Thumbs down. Tempest. Another unreleased prototype. While they could have released Aquaventure with a few tweaks, Tempest rightfully got tossed into the garbage can of history. The Atari 2600 cannot do diagonals, and for some reason it can't do vector graphics. Tempest looks awful, it controls horribly, and is a mess to play. Hit detection is broken, flickering is present, and more often than not you'll end up getting killed by an invisible shot. This is one of those games that I'm not sure which side insisted on putting it on the Evercade, but they shouldn't have. Not even for preservation reasons. Thumbs down. Video Pinball. Video Pinball is awesome, and I don't recommend it to any modern gamers. What you'll find here is a pinball game from 1980, an era where consoles couldn't do diagonal lines, let alone simulate pinball physics. Video pinball games of the 80s and 90s have a special jank to them, and they make sense, but in their own special way. You can't come into it expecting a realistic pinball game. It is unlike any post-late 90s pinball game that you might have played, and you get used to the quirky counterfeit gravity pretty slowly. Effectively, video pinball is to pinball games what Kung Fury is to action movies. Also, it's boring. Aw, oh, it's so boring. Since this is the second last game, I'm going to torture you with how boring this game is. 
A very confused thumbs up. Yars Return. Yars Revenge is a great game. Yars Return is a homebrew ROM hack to an outsourced Chinese sequel because nothing says modern day Atari quite like not being capable of doing anything in house. Because I'm not cruel, I have opted to post screenshots of Yars Return instead of the seizure inducing gameplay. I'll put that in at the end. Also, the Elgato completely borked the capture process, so it doesn't really indicate the full game anyway. The goal of Yars Return is to shoot the force field and clear a path to the alien within. You do this while avoiding attacks in a seeker alien that is constantly following you around the map. The area circling the playfield is a force field where you can't be harmed but also can't shoot from inside. Get through the force field and you'll have to direct a shot through and hit the alien. Then you move on to the next level. There are two variations to the maps. I will say one thing. Do not play Yars Return hooked up via HDMI. I had the outer force field burned into my TV screen. It's probably also about 30% worse for your eyes to see the pixels flashing about on a big screen. And trust me when I say, uh, do not take the seizure epilepsy warning with anything other than the utmost seriousness. I don't have epilepsy. I got a little nauseous playing this game. Thumbs up. Conclusion. Out of 20 games on the Atari cartridge, I would recommend 11. So just over half. It's not a bad value proposition at just under $2 per game actually worth playing. Atari games are in the realm of love it or leave it, and odds are if you're looking at buying the Evercade, you fall into the category of nostalgic classic gamer or curious newcomer. Thankfully, you can play most of the archived Atari games in your browser. Well, that's the end of my review of the Atari Collection number one for the Evercade. There are nine more cartridges left to go in the launch lineup, with Namco Collection number one next. This is probably the part where I should say if you like this content, give a thumbs up and subscribe. Do that thing. Thank <laughs> you.